Welcome to Offwatch and a special edition of our weekly interview series. It is 47 years to the day that the Ocean Race started back in 1973 as the Whitbread Round the World Race. And that first edition was won by an unlikely crew from Mexico setting on board Sayula 2. I sat down with Enrico Carlin, a crew member on board the boat, but also son of the skipper, Ramon Carlin, who was victorious in that very first edition of the race. He talked me through what it was like to step on board into the unknown of ocean-going, round-the-world racing back when it was very new, and he started by showing me some very impressive silverware. Oh, wow, look at that. It's a beautiful piece. And here's the, how many miles and time was there. And here are the name of the first, second, and whatever. Okay. And this is a nice piece, a broken mass with the waves and the albatross. It's beautiful. Oh, I see. I, I, I didn't realize it was, yeah, I didn't. I, now you say a broken mast. I can see it. Yeah. Broken mast, the sea waves, and the albatross oh, nice. flying on it. Yeah. Yeah, they are they are beautiful pieces. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And you obviously look after them very well because they're looking brand new. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. My father my father and mother used to to have them polished and you know, put some uh gold plate gold plated or silver plated whatever it is. But it's they're they're in good shape. Yeah, it's not, it's worth to have that. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I, I uh, very often with sailing trophies, you you have you know you get it, you get to hold it up in front of the camera, then they take it back, they put it in the museum, they put it in the yeah, yacht club. Right. It's nice to see that you have yours at home. Yeah, well, I was planning uh, for next time. I think uh, for the. For the beginning of the race, I want to take Sayula down to Alicante. I'm doing the plans now. And uh, so it can be at the start of the race, at like a buoy. I hope nobody hits us, but <laughs> I have there. And uh, I, I would like to have it also whenever it come, they come back to Geneva. Or Genoa, sorry. Mm. Genoa, yeah. Mm. So maybe that that sound that will sound good for Mr. Prices. <laughs> so, I hope that sounds so, good. Oh, look, it sounds good to me, and I'm sure it sounds good to everybody. So you know, Sayula, this is the same boat that 47 years ago you started the very first race. It, it, I mean, how often do you get to go sailing in it? I mean, it, has it has it kept alive all this time? Well, uh, my father kept uh, sailing for a long, long time. And, uh, well, he invited uh, mostly uh, the family and some friends. And, uh, well, the last time he he got on the boat was down here in Puerto Vallarta. He kept it in Acapulco and after that in Puerto Vallarta. But it, it it's in good shape. It's very, very nice uh, uh, kept on. And uh, well, we love to have it in the in uh, in the family. I, I I tell people that I'm still romantic with the Sayula, because whenever I get practical, I'll sell it. <laughs> it's just yeah. Does that's it, a, well, d does it still win races? Do you get a chance to race it? No, not anymore. No, since uh, we had the first well, the round the world race. And then after that, Ramon said, my father said, uh, let's not race anymore. The last race we did was on the bicentennial of the United States in 76. We raced from Bermuda to Newport, Rhode Island, and we won first in line. <laughs> so that's it. No, no, more, no, more, no more races. So we are, we've been uh, cruising and, and I cruise every winter because down here it's warm. So I would go in winter all into the Sea of Cortez and we go all the way in the, in the, in the Mexican Pacific mostly. Okay, so 
let, let, let me wind the clock back again because it's an amazing story and it's an amazing achievement to be the first at anything, the first winner. It's wonderful. But I think that your victory is even more incredible, incredible because back then, the impression that I get was your father really wanted to win, but he didn't have a boat when he decided to do the race. He didn't have a crew. What was the first moment when you thought, OK, let's do this? Well, I, I, I explained it. We went down to our, I was going down to Ireland to study because I wanted to get married and he just pulled me out, okay, <laughs> of the way. So he invited me down to Ireland to study English. And after that, in, in London, we, he found the brochure for the Whitbread Round the World Race. So he kept the brochure like that and he asked me, well, would you like to go? Mm, of course, let's go. So here, here he is with no boat, no crew, only he and me. That was all. And so he decided that, that at that time, and he was, it was fantastic. He, when he makes decisions, he is very determined. And so he, he's like that. He, he's been like that for all his life, in business, in sports, in anything. Okay, so that's when we got down to London. And after that, he went down to find out about the boat. So he went down to CNC. He went down to, with some friends to look after some boats. And he found the boat he wanted, but in 48 foot. So he went to Peja Cosquenquila down in Outer. And he talked with him and he said, well, Ramon, I have the, the boat you want, it's okay. But I have a new boat, a 65-footer, that it's going to be completely different. The crew is going to be about the same. The, the, the dinner will be, well, the, the meals and everything will be about the same. So you need more play. So why don't you buy a bigger boat and you'll be more comfortable? So he went, oh, no, it doesn't sound bad. Okay, yeah, let's go. So Sayula, it's uh, the number three hole. And Pekka told Ramon, Ramon, I won't have the boat for, for you because number three is already sold. They, they, they have to give me the payment, so the, the first payment so they can have the boat. And I don't know how, but he was so lucky and he got the number three call. So we, he got the three call and he got the, into the race. But and, yeah, he wasn't, uh, he, he didn't have any boat nor nothing when he signed and gave the money for the entrance. It, it, on one level, it's so different from the experience of the professional sailors today. But at the same time, it's very similar. You have somebody who decides, I must do this race. I want to win. I want to do it. Then you find the money, you find the boat, you, you know, you find the crew. Considering that you were the first person <laughs> to join the crew, if you like, I don't know how much choice you had as, uh, as part of the family. How, how much did you, when did you think maybe we could win? Or was it always a surprise? Well, uh, at first, he, he would say always, if you enter a, a, a competition, you, you go to win. Hmm. And I think that's a good thought because you always go to a competition to win. But I think at that time, we were a very diverse, uh, uh, how do you say, a crew. There were experienced guys and there were uh, guys with no experience. So uh, I, I don't know, who, but you didn't know really what was going to happen. The first thought it was, is let's finish the race. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that that was the first, first thing. And when we got down to Cape Town, we were in second place. So that's where Ramon said, hey, this is good. This is real good and we can win this. So that's why we, we went into the, we followed the race and well, it was, the next leg was terrible. Waves very big, winds very uh, frightening. It was terrible, but I think the first thing was let's finish the race. I think that that was the best thing. How, I'm wondering how close you were um, to not finishing the race, because like you say, it's so, it's so hard. It was hard back in 73 and it's hard today. If you had finished that first leg and you hadn't, you hadn't found out that you were in second, you, you, you weren't doing that well. If the second leg was so hard, I mean, would you have said, okay, you know, we have to pull away. How close were you to not finishing? Well, my father, I think, wasn't uh, going to to go out of the, to leave the race. <laughs> uh, for of course, I, I was going to leave the race in in Cape Town because, well, I I was too young and I was a spoiled, maybe a spoiled guy. <laughs> and and well, and, and I said, well, father, I, I don't want to I don't want to go on with this race. And he said, well, it's okay, but whatever you begin, you must finish for you and for Mexico. So let's go on. You have to go on, but it's your decision. So I made the decision and I went on. But of course, I think my father didn't think of leaving the race until after this next leg. The next leg, we capsized mm. with a wave of a uh, 40-footer wave. And so we, it was uh, tremendous. But after that leg, I think everybody would think this is crazy. Uh, I don't know. It, it's just incredible. But but we were in first place. So so there's no way to lock you, but to have a first place on the hand and say, well, I'm leaving. No, you're not leaving. You keep on, and we kept on. When you're out at sea, one of the things that is different from the early editions and now, now the sailors know roughly where they are in the race, or at least they know every six hours. But when you did the race, you would start the leg and you wouldn't know the result until the finish. Um, almost, uh, yeah, well, if they don't lie to you on the radio, they, you would know that. But uh, mostly in the first leg, we didn't have contact with everybody every each time but in the second leg we began to have contact with everybody because there were two men lost in the second leg and one on the third mm. and i think it got very rough so i think that's that's why we we kept together very closely by radio well but they you can lie for one mile maybe but you cannot lie for 100 miles <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it was uh, yeah. It's no way to lie. And um, I mean, you say you you could keep in touch with radio, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Your radio broke. I think after the capsize that you were mentioning. So there was a period where you couldn't get in touch with anybody, and the race organizers, I mean, hadn't heard from you for some time. Yeah, I think it was uh, for about uh, one week or something like that. Until, well, here is my chart. We were near to per, uh, on the near to on on to Perth, and that's when we capsized. And then we have to go into the channel. And when we got into the channel, Ray and Roddy, our navigator, got in touch with the lantern with a, with the merchant uh, ship. So he told the merchant ship to say that we were Sayula two and the, that we were all right and we were coming to Sydney. That was incredible. I think what that, one of the main tactics is, is to have a navigator, a good navigator, because he can show, at that time you didn't have all 
the new things you have now. But at that time, he would go into BBC and would have the points where the, the cold front was coming. So he would do that and we would follow the, the cold fronts. So he, it was, I think, one of the basic tactics we had. And uh, what what did you see? I mean, you mentioned the navigator. What else did you see at, I think you were 18 when you did the race? Did you, did you realize that the navigator was that good then? Or did it take you some time? I think this was, this was Ray, the navigator. Um, did you know at 18, this guy's good? Or <laughs> was it all just new? No, yes, I think he he was good because he he would uh, have a shot with Ramon uh, every often, and I think he 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 they were they were looking at the stra strategic with the strategic to to do the right thing on the right time. I think they they both did a good good job. They had good, good communications, and we had a good job because we learned the ones we didn't that didn't have so much. Uh, hours on sailing, we we found we learned a lot, and uh, well, I think we did a good job. Of but course, describe your father to me because um, the biggest thing that people always talk about with any team is the skipper and how they manage the crew, get people working hard, get people feeling good. What kind of skipper was was your father? Well, he was very determined, as I tell you, and he he would uh, he would have order always on the boat. He liked it very much to have order, because whenever when we capsize, where's the pump? So you have to find the pump. So uh, it, that's order, and I think he would he he loved that, and I, I think one of the most beautiful things he had was he was a loving captain. He was very loving. He will care of us. He will have. He will give us some wine every day, just to be relaxed, not drunk, but relaxed. Uh, nice warm uh, meals, and you don't get that now. But even that, you have good uh, leaders now that can bring. Without that, they can bring things. Okay. But he was loving. He was very, very nice and loving father. Uh, we, we, we tell him that he was like a hen with his chicks. Okay, he was always like this. And he will care about people. I think that's uh, the most leading thing you can have. And what you learn on the boat is to, to go with people, to learn of people and to be kind with people. Okay, I think that's tremendous. But he's a, he was a great leader. Uh, as I told you, not only sailing, he, he put a ranch and he was very good on the ranch, a goat, no, a cheap ranch. He had the business since 1950 and he was good in his business. He, had, he was a leader of the family. Uh, and in, in anything he did, he was a great leader. I, I, I... It's interesting that you say that I've read interviews with other people on the boat and they all say the same thing, that there was a atmosphere where uh, there, it was not luxurious, it was hard, but there was a little bit of comfort, maybe the wine, maybe the food. But, you know, how well did you eat on the boat? Oh, we, we ate the bit. Every day we had uh, meat, every day we had a, a good uh, salad, uh, well, with uh, coleslaw or whatever, but we always had something. At that time, things were canned, so it was very difficult to have a, a nice thing dried or whatever, but we have canned things and we had beans and we had everything. So we had a warm meal every day. Spaghetti and this. When we capsized, we found spaghetti inside the radios, and jam also. So, so we, the, you know, but we had fantastic lunch and fantastic dinners. A little bit of wine. We have the the magic table. 
there's the table for for the meals, and below that there's a a, a small uh, thing you put the wine in, the wines. So every time you would say, uh, "Kid, bring, the, uh, give me a bottle." So that's a magic table. You take out wine <laughs> every time you want it. <laughs> that was incredible. I when. A lot of people, when they look back at their experience in the race, you know, even today, there are some things, normally the bad things, that fade away. And, I, you know, it's the good memories. They're the ones you remember. I haven't had the opportunity of asking somebody like yourself who has such a long time between when they did the race and today what is it that that if you go down onto Sayula now, what do you remember? What, what's the, the clearest memory of being there on the waves racing? Ooh. Well, it's a, a nice remembrance. You, when you're at the sea, you don't feel it like it because uh, you're every day on that. And so it's very monotonous. So it's very difficult to think many things since when you're sailing because you're bored or you're tired or whatever because the watches goes on. But when when you're after that and after you, you do the race, when you finish the race, you say, well, what's next? Let's do race again because you're hot and warm, you're, you're, you want to go on. But uh, after a while you say, well, I did that and I'm glad, that, well, I'm glad also that we won the race, of course, but it's a living, a uh, very nice living, uh, how do you say, uh, opportunity that you have to learn about, to love the ocean, to go without any engine, you know, that's, that's tremendous. That's something that you cannot change for nothing. You know, it's, it's just tremendous. And, and what about the victory then? Because every sailor in the race will experience that. But for the victory, when you sailed back across the, you know, you completed the final leg, sailed across the finish line, you have won the race, the first Whitbread Round the World race. What happened then in the next few days? Obviously, it's big for you, it's big for your family, it's big for Mexico. Yeah, well, you finish the race, you, you don't believe it. You, be, <laughs> you know, you, you have to pinch me so I, I can believe what's going on with this because you, you get very nice and you're in the clouds and you feel incredible. I think that's uh, one of the things you, you, you cannot say to somebody how you feel. It's, it's just uh, enormous. It's uh, great. And uh, well, after, after a while, you, you go into the uh, trophies, uh, when they give you the trophies and all that, and, and you feel incredible. You know, it's just uh, may maybe you get drunk for a while because you're <laughs> you don't know what was going on and you like it. But it's uh, yeah, you're in the clouds. I think you're in the clouds. It's it's enormous feeling, very they, very nice feeling. They, there's a team Mexico that wants to do the next edition of the race. Yeah, Viva uh, Mexico. Yeah, now. Um, how much would it mean to you to have Seula there at the start line for the next edition, if if you can make it happen, and to see a Mexican team in the race, racing hard? Okay, well, we already talked about it down here, but we gave them the, how do you say, the kick. We gave them the kick down in Puerto Vallarta. So we already have uh, kicked them for the race, wishing good luck and good race and favorable wins. But I think I'm, it's a must that I have to do an effort 
to bring the ball down to the start line and to the finish line. I think that's a must. And I, I wish, uh, well, somebody that, that it's hearing me say, well, yeah, that's, that's how it has to be. It's still in the family and it's still Sayula and it's still the first winner. So it has to be there. As I told Ramon, my father, uh, when they made the, the, the dinner in, in Alicante in 2011, he, he didn't want to go. He was old already. And I say, Ramon, I take you, but you have to be there because you are the winner of everything. So mm. you have to be there, for, of course. And I think that's a must that Sayula may have to be down there and we have to bring her. It's only 40 days, so no problem. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing after what you've done. Take off it's time. nothing. Yeah. Well, I can take up some time from work. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm retired, but I work a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think it's a must. And one of the best things, I think, it, it would be nice if, if some of the crew members can come and sail down in, in, that, uh, in, in, in the med and uh, join us to have the start line and then join us to have the finish line. I think that'll be great. Only my father is, uh, well, my father and my mother are, are passed away, but, but all the others, uh, they're okay. So maybe they, they might come. Okay. I, if they don't, after we uh, after we release this, I'm sure you will get a lot of people offering the chance to be crew because, like you say, it's the boat, it's the victory, the very, very, very first. So um, you've been very kind with your time, and before I let you go, I want to get another look at the trophy um, for the for the overall. So, can, do you mind just bringing it again? So this was the here it is. This is the first ocean race trophy. What was the the Whitbread Round the World race? Um, has this always been in your possession? Yeah, of my father on his house. He 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 kept it on his house at Mexico City. I live now in Monterrey on the north. Okay, and this is beautiful. Look at this. Oh, it's been yeah. It, I, I'm getting a good view of it, but can you describe it? How, how is it well, put there are, the design? There are three, three spinnakers, two here, one here, and the globe is here, okay, with a, with a silver plated and gold plated. And down at the Pacific Ocean, that is the biggest one, it says all the names of the, whoever was on the race, the, all oh, the boats. Wow. Okay, down here, and down here it says how many miles and and everything it had. Wow. Well, I don't know if you can see that, but just it's about difficult. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this one, I I would like to take it down and lend it for the museum in mm -hmm. in Alicante. Also, this one, and also this one. This is the Roaring Forties first place. That's it. First and second leg. No, second and third leg. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. It's they, a beautiful piece. It really is. I mean, it, 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 they're beautiful pieces of art. They, they, they look yeah. fantastic. They are beautiful. Yeah. Of course. You, one of the things you just mentioned, you said that on the trophy you have the names of uh, the skippers, you know, the other boats, the other competitors. I wonder. Just the name of the boat. Just the name of the boat. Uh, yeah. I, so you are uh, Adventure, uh, Grand Louis, Criter, Wea, Great Britain second, Second Life, CSNRB, British Soldier, Tauranga, uh, Copernicus, Tranto Export, Otago. Peter Von Dancing, uh, who else? Burton Cotter. That I, I I've seen Burton Cotter coming to Mexico. Really? Uh, with another name, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine is bringing it down to Acapulco. Penduic Six. 
Oh, wow. Penduik Three, Concord, and Jacaranda. So there were a lot of boats in there. A lot of boats, but also some really big names. You know, you mentioned um, Penduik, so Eric Teverly and, and... Eric Teverly. You've got some big names in the race. And I, I wonder, what was the atmosphere like? Because, of course, even back then, you are competing against each other, but you're also going out to do something that's dangerous and you have to rely on each other. What was the atmosphere like between the teams? Well, the, between the teams, uh, at the beginning, they, they would look at us uh, very strange. <laughs> they would uh, hoax at us saying, well, you Mexicans, what are you doing? Are you going around the winches or what? But after that, well, uh, it's okay. But after that, we found that we were in better place than others. And uh, But after that, in the first uh, stop, the second and all of the others, we will be okay with everybody. I think that, that's what I told you. You learn to, to live with people and to be very nicely with them because there's no other way to be. You have to be with, with kind with people. You, you cannot be fighting every day. You, you cannot do walls in between countries as this nice president we have on the North. And it's just incredible. But. I would take off all the how do you, border lines in the world and just go wherever you like to go and don't ask any permission. Just say, I'm here. But that, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really look forward to seeing Sayula in Alicante for the start of the race. And I'm sure that everybody watching this if they haven't realized already, will know that uh, how important that boat is, how important your story is, and how important your father has been to the race. Um, you've been really kind making the time to talk to me. Thank you very much. And I really hope I'm going to get to see those trophies for real in the museum very soon. That would be a big treat. No, I'm, I'm very glad to hear about you and, and to have this interview. Uh, and I'm pleased that all this was because of my father. Well, and all his crew, of course. But uh, he was a, an enormous guy. And thank you very much, anyway. Well, my thanks to Enrique for taking the time to talk to us and giving us an idea of where this race started and those memories of his father being victorious in the very first edition. If you enjoyed this interview, leave us a like and subscribe for more. Next week, we're taking another look back at 1973 and more of those incredible stories about where this race started. We'll see you then.